All right, we're ready for Ezekiel chapters 24 to 26 in our survey through the book of Ezekiel. If you're following the handout, and many of you are, you might go ahead and turn to the last thing on the second page. And you're looking for seven times where it is said, then shall they know that I am the Lord or some equivalent. And so uh, you want to be watching for that. We'll call, we'll flag those as we go along. There's seven. Unless I've miscounted, I know there's at least seven. There may be more, but I think there's seven in our study tonight. All right, let's talk about where we've been and where we're going. This is our outline of the book of Ezekiel we look at each time. And there are three major sections. We're closing out the first with chapter 24. And the first section is dealing with the judgment on Jerusalem. And we'll come back to that disciplined nation in a moment. Then we're ready for the second major section, as we have in several of the prophets. And we'll talk about the nation's section and other prophets when we get to that, starting in chapter 25. Now, that'll carry us through chapter 32. Um, so we're going to look at several different nations uh, that are prophesied against here in this section, uh, starting in chapter 25. So we're going to get into that. Then the third major section has to do with the restoration of God's people. Now let's talk about that disciplined nation. This is what we've already seen thus far. And we've talked about the certainty of the destruction upon a sinful nation, which is what the whole first 24 chapters are about. Then there is this prediction or prophecy concerning the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem. And in our last week's study, we talked about these three things. We talked about the Ammonites, that they're going to be slain by the sword. There was a list of the sins of Jerusalem that were given in chapter 22. That was the main focal point there. And then there's the parable of the two immortal, immoral sisters. Uh, one representing Israel and the other representing Judah. And uh, here's what they have done and here's where they have gone. Now let's add to that, and this is where we're going tonight to finish this section. Chapter 24, there are two thoughts found in chapter 24, as you've already read ahead, hopefully. The boiling pot and the death of Ezekiel's wife portray the fall of Jerusalem. And so the whole section is talking about Jerusalem's going to fall. Now, I keep reminding you of this, but uh, hopefully this gets ingrained in us that, that uh, there were false prophets and people who followed the false prophets who bought into this concept that while there have been two invasions, and Ezekiel has already gone into captivity, that the third invasion is not going to be successful, the false prophet said, and Jerusalem is not going to fall, not going to happen. And so here's the certainty of that that's pictured time and time again. So let's talk about this parable of the cooking pot in verses 1 to 14 before we get to the prophet's wife and her death. So one of the things you're looking for here is uh, a date that's given in the ninth year, in the tenth month, the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me saying, well, that's 588 B.C. Now that's just two years now before the final invasion in 586 B.C., when Jerusalem falls. So this is when Nebuchadnezzar be, uh, begins his siege. That lasted for a year and a half. And so from 588 to 586 B.C. Uh, is when the siege is taking place. So it lasted for several months. But uh, the same year in which that siege started is when this prophecy and this parable is being given. Now, there's some reminder here of what we saw in chapter 11. You might back up just for reference or make a marginal note at least to go back and look at chapter 11 and verse 3 beginning. We won't read all of that, but you remember in chapter 11 and in verse 3 that the people were saying that the city of Jerusalem is the cauldron or the pot and we are the meat. But they were using it from this temple. They were making this parallel. That is, those who are holding out false hope that we are being protected as the fire can't get to the meat in the, in the pot uh, because of the protection. The city is protecting us. We are protected and, and this invasion is not going to happen. They had misused that illustration. Well, that's just a connection that the city is being compared uh, to the pot and the people are the meat. Well, in this parable, the city is the pot and the people are the meat. But not in the sense of chapter 11, as the people had misused that. So let's see what happens in verses 1 to 14. He said, Son of man, write down the name of the city, uh, the name of the day, the name, uh, the name of the day, this very day, the king of Babylon started the siege against Jerusalem this very day. Mark it down. 
uh, when he starts this, that this is what's going to happen. So what's the value of that? Uh, if we didn't get any further, we learned a very valuable lesson here that Ezekiel writes down and gives this prophecy. This is what's going to happen to the city the very day he starts the siege. The false prophets were saying, oh yeah, he's going to start the siege, but he's not going to be successful in that. And when it all comes to fruition, the point's going to be made later in the chapter, then they're going to know I'm the Lord. That indeed Ezekiel was speaking by the, by the word of the Lord. So he says in verse 3, utter a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, put on a pot, set on, uh, set on it and pour water in it, gather pieces of choice meat, good meat. And uh, look at verse 5, take the choice of the flock and pile fuel bones under it and let the cut simmer. And so in other words, take this cooking pot and fill it full of water and let it boil and then throw choice pieces of meat in there and build a good fire up under it and, and boil and let that meat simmer. Now at verse 3, he said, he turns and talks about why the city is going to be treated like this cooking pot. Woe to the bloody city, the pot whose scum is in it and whose scum is not gone from it. Bring it out piece by piece. Now we'll come back to the bringing it out piece by piece. He said, you're like, uh, the city of Jerusalem is like this cooking pot that still has all the scum in it. It's never been cleaned. And so it's like a cooking pot you've cooked with and then you just toss the stuff out, but then it never, never clean. You cook again and you toss stuff out and it's never clean. And you just think of all the scum that would be on the inside, whether it be the rust or the food that's caked on, there's just scum all inside. And he said, let that cook and simmer. And then he says, bring the pieces out piece by piece. That seems to indicate without discrimination and without any order. It's not like, we'll get this piece first and then this piece and then get that piece of meat and then this, this one is next. Just start gathering without any discrimination and without any order, get the pieces of meat out. And bring them out on, and on which no lot has fallen without discrimination and without order, in other words. In verse 7, for her blood is in her midst. Now, he turns and talks about what the city has done. It's because the blood is in, in the open. Her sins are in the open. She is unashamed of her sins, the city of Jerusalem. She's covered the ground with her blood, with the blood of her sins. And uh, notice it, verse 8, I have set her blood on the top of the rock that it may not be covered. I've exposed her sins. And therefore the Lord said, woe to the bloody city. He said, I will make the pyre. If you're reading from the New King James, and it's the only translation that does this, Talks, calls this the pyre, which is simply a, a pile of kindling or pile of combustibles. All other translations say a pile, P-I-L-E. The New King James says a pyre, P-Y-R-E. And it's just a pile of combustible. In other words, God said, I'm going to have a pile of kindling myself. You ought to think about this cooking pot, a literal cooking pot that you built a kindling and a fire up under it, but I'm kindling a fire myself. In fact, I'm heaping up quite a pile of kindling and heap up the wood and kindle the fire and cook the meat well and mix in the spices and let it cook and burn and then set the pot on the empty coals. Now, after you've cooked all of that, then you empty all the meat out and you set the pot back on the coals and let it get hot. Now, why are you doing that? Because you're going to cleanse it and take all the scum out of it and let the scum be in the fire and so he's pointed, verse 13 and 14, you're going to be cleansed of your scum because you've never been cleansed before. That is, when they were preached to by other prophets, they never were cleansed of their scum. When they were dealt with by Isaiah and with Jeremiah, they never did cleanse themselves of their scum. In other words, they didn't fully repent, is the point. That's so why the Lord has spoken, I'm reading it, verse 14, it shall come to pass and I will do and I will not hold back, I will not spare, nor will I relent, according to your ways and according to your deeds. In other words, I'm going to cleanse this pot of Jerusalem. I'm going to cleanse all the scum out of it. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to bring Babylon upon you and you're going to be fully cleansed. So the city is going to fall and it's going to collapse. This is the third and the final invasion. So what that does is that pictures the, the fall of Jerusalem with this cooking pot. Now, that's not surprising to us. If this was the first time you'd been in any class on Ezekiel or study of Ezekiel, kind of, it's kind of an interesting way to... But this is how Ezekiel has approached this, or God through Ezekiel has approached it all along. He's been demonstrating, illustrating, and acting out all through the book. And here's another case. Starting at verse 15 now. He talks about the prophet's wife. Now, you want to learn some practical stuff right here. There's some very practical stuff to learn from this section. 
He said, uh, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I, t- I, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke. He's talking about his wife, and he calls her, and her the desire of your eyes. I'm taking away your wife in one stroke. And you shall neither mourn nor weep, nor shall tears run down. Sigh in silence, make no mourning for the dead. I do not take that, that God is saying to him, your wife's going to die and you're not to be sorrowful at all. But I think it's in front of others or in public. He's going to sigh, according to verse 17, in silence. He is sighing. He is sad. He is going to mourn. But this is not going to be done before others. He's to symbolize something and he's going to explain it. Obviously, like everything else, when he was acting like he was going off into captivity or he's lying down and uh, mock siege, all those other examples, people are going to, what on earth? Your wife just, what's going on? Why aren't you crying? And it's an occasion for him to teach, an occasion for him to preach and to prophesy. So he said, look at verse 17, sigh in silence and uh, make no mourning for the dead. Bind your turban on your head and put sandals on your feet and do not cover your lips and do not eat a man's bread of sorrow. Uh, The idea of covering the lips perhaps had reference to covering the lower part of the face uh, in in a sign of mourning. The idea of eating another man's bread perhaps is food that friends may have brought as we would do in our own time. Uh, And that's part of the comfort we get, not just the fact that we have food, but people bring us food so we don't have to focus on cooking and and seeing to our meals. And we're eating that somewhat in comfort because it shows someone cares about us. Don't eat people's food that they bring to you. And don't mourn in public and don't put a a garment over your lower part of your face. Now verse 18, if you don't mark any other verse tonight, mark this one. So I spoke to the people in the morning and that evening my wife died. I take it that he told them, the Lord's told me my wife's going to die. And that night she did. Here's the part I want you to note. I did as I was commanded. I agree with McGuigan. What a man. What a man. I don't know about you, but I hear a great deal today about it different when it comes to family. It's different when it comes to family. Uh, When something goes on in my family, that's different. And so we set aside some of the requirements of God and whatever God's told us to do because this involves blood and this involves family. Ezekiel said, I did as I was commanded. What if God had told you, your mate's going to die? And you tell other people, the Lord's told me my mate's going to die and they die. But God also told me not to mourn in public and not to receive comfort from people and could it be said go back to verse 18 if you didn't underline I did as I was commanded what a man you take cases like Abraham drawing back the knife to kill his son with family it wasn't different with Ezekiel his wife dies and with family it was not any different what a man he was now here's the point of that look at verse 19 and uh, and the people said to me will you not tell us what these things signify to us and why you behave so it's exactly what God knew would have why are you acting your wife just died and you're not mourning and we we bring you food and and you're you're not being come you, you act like nothing has happened and I answered and I said the word of the Lord came to me and he said speak to the house of Israel That I will profane my sanctuary. You see, my wife, he says, uh, is implying, was the desire of my eyes. In your eyes, the temple is described as your arrogant boast. The desire of your eyes, the delight of your souls, and your sons and your daughters left behind shall fall by the sword. Remember the statement, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. They they put confidence. The temple is still here. And as long as the temple stands, God is with us. God's protecting us. And you should do as I have done. And you shall not cover your lips 
nor eat a man's bread of sorrow, and your turban shall be on your head, and neither shall you weep, nor shall you pine away in the iniquities, uh, but you shall pine away in the iniquities and, uh, and, and mourn with one another. Thus Ezekiel is a sign to you, according to all that he has done, you shall do. Now what's the significance of that? Why would they not mourn? Perhaps for one of two reasons, or maybe both are involved. Perhaps it's because when the destruction comes on Jerusalem, they're going to be so stunned they can't mourn. You've seen that with somebody who just suddenly got news of someone dying and they're not shedding a tear because it, they're almost in a state of shock. They're stunned. They, they, they haven't processed it yet. Maybe that's why they're not going to mourn. Or it may be because they recognize and acknowledge that the judgment is just. We, we had this coming and there is no reason to mourn. Whatever the case may be, just as I, Ezekiel said, was not mourning, you're not going to mourn either when that happens. Here's your first of the seven, verse 27. When this comes, you shall know I am the Lord. It's going to happen. Jerusalem's going to fall. The temple's going to be destroyed. And when it happens, you'll know that I'm the Lord. Now, let's finish that chapter 24, and uh, then we're ready to move on. Uh, and the Son of Man, it will not be in the day that I take from you the stronghold uh, their joy and their glory. Here's other descriptions of how they viewed the temple, the desire of your eyes. In other words, God said, I'm going to take all of that away from you. And on that day, one who escapes will come and let you hear with your ears. In other words, Ezekiel's going to hear. So from this point of these two, two, two statements here concerning the fall of Jerusalem, Jeremiah, I mean, Ezekiel's not going to have any more to say about the fall of Jerusalem itself. Until it happens. And when it does, a messenger is going to come running and saying, Jerusalem fell. The temple is gone. Then what happens? Verse 27. On that day your mouth will be opened to him who escaped. And you shall speak and no longer be mute. And this, thus you shall be assigned to them. Here we go our second time. They shall know that I'm the Lord. Here's another sign. Not only did Jerusalem fall. But you're going to be mute from this point till that point. And you're not going to talk anymore about that. And then suddenly what's going to happen is a messenger is going to come running and he gives you the message. And then you'll open up and you'll speak. And that's another sign to these people that indeed you're a prophet of God. It'll be a little late. It'll be a little late, but they're going to know that you're a prophet of God. All right. That finishes this first section of a disciplined nation uh, or the, the first major section, but this subsection of a disciplined nation, the boiling pot and the death of Ezekiel's wife. Practical things we learn there in chapter 25. Time permits, we'll come back and get, get a few more of those practical things. Now let's talk about the nation section. Uh, this is one of the things of the prophets. Whether you're talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, you're talking about Nahum, you're talking about Obadiah, you talk about Ezekiel. Uh, these passages that deal with the nation's section are often viewed as kind of dull and boring. We get excited about Judah and Israel because that is the nation of God's people. But here's a, a prophecy against Egypt and here's one against Ammon and against Moab. Big deal. What's that for us? And what does that mean to us? And why is this here? Why do I have to keep reading one nation after the other? It says the same thing to all of them. And I take the view that this was put here for us to read and to understand. And if God mentioned in Ezekiel and he mentions it in Jeremiah and he mentioned it in Isaiah and he mentioned it in other prophets and almost the same thing in all of those, then he must have wanted me to read it all those many times or he wouldn't have put it there. And so I'm going to give God the benefit of the doubt that it's for, for my good. I need to know that. So let's talk about the nation section. This is judgment on the Gentile nations. And so you're looking for this in your handout. We're going to list some things here, eight things. And you're looking for this in your handout. Uh, not this, but uh, what we're about to get to. Uh, I like what Kaiser said. He said, such oracles of judgment appear in most prophetic books. Not every prophet has a nation section, but most of the prophets have a nation's section. Isaiah did. Jeremiah did. Ezekiel does. Amos does. Here's, here's some nation section if you want to keep up with these. Isaiah chapter 13 uh, through 23 is the nation section. So there's just numerous nations that are dealt with besides Judah. Well, we hadn't been, hadn't been long since we looked at Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a pretty hefty section from 46 to 51 about the nations. 
Some of the same nations we're studying tonight, by the way. Uh, Ezekiel 25 to 32, we're looking at several nations. Um, Amos 1 and 2, Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum. And so this must be an important thing to be pointed out is that God is judging the nations. So we raise this question, what's accomplished or learned in the nations section? More than, let's just skim through this quickly if we, as if we didn't have time to do it and we just skim through and create, okay, Ammon's going to be destroyed and Moab and Edom and, and, and the, the Phoenicians, that is Tyre and Sidon and uh, later Egypt. Okay, we got it. Uh, the nations are going to be judged. No, we learn a lot more. Let's begin listing these. Here's number one. I learned that God is in control of the nations. Nobody drives this at home any better than, than uh, Daniel does, that God rules in the kingdoms of men. Chapter 4 particularly, but God rules in the kingdoms of men. That was the point made over and over and over in Daniel. But I learned that in Isaiah, and I learned it in Jeremiah, and I learned it in Ezekiel, and I learned it in Amos. That God is in control of the nations. What a powerful lesson to learn. When things seem in chaos, if you watch the news and you say, this, this country's going down the tubes. You may be right. You say, I don't know what the future holds. Well, you, you're right. You don't know. But I do know this. I know that God is in control and he always will be in control. Here's the second thing I learned. God is in control of all the nations. In other words, God was in control of Judah and Israel, but he was also in control of Egypt and Babylon and Assyria, Syria, Ammon, Moab, time would fail us to go on. Well, is God in control of the United States? Certainly so, but he's also in control of Russia and China and all these other countries. Here's a third lesson I learned. God uses nations as tools. He used Babylon as a tool. He used Assyria as a tool. God may use another nation as a tool to punish us, but God may use us as a tool to punish another nation. That could happen, couldn't it? It doesn't mean we're better, more righteous, even more powerful. This means God wanted to use that tool. All right, here's something else I learned from this. God is fair in dealing with nations. God is fair in dealing with nations. That is, what he, if Ammon commits a sin, God deals with that. If Moab does the same thing, God deals with that. Here's something else I learned. God is working out his purpose in time. God is working out his purpose in time. When, when God brings Babylon in to, or Assyria, let's start with Assyria. When he brings Assyria in, he's, he's working out his plan. God brings Babylon in and punishes Judah God's working out his plan. And then when God punishes Babylon, he's working out his plan. God has a plan, ultimately, for, and when he brings back the nation and the remnant, God's working out his plan. Nations are held accountable. As individuals, we're held accountable. But nations are held accountable. God held Babylon accountable. Were there good people in Babylon? Sure. Were there good people in Judah? Sure. But God held the nation as a whole accountable. Here's another principle I learned, that God will strike a nation and yet God will heal a nation. Uh, what we've been reading so far, primarily, is that God's going to strike Judah. Not much has been said in Ezekiel about God healing. Now, there'll be more about that later, but Isaiah said more about that. And Jeremiah said it somewhat more, perhaps, than Ezekiel did. And then the reasons that nations are destroyed is sin and rebellion. God doesn't destroy a, a nation because, I just don't want that nation around it's because of their sin. So why did God destroy uh, Ammon? Sin. You say, well, what was the problem with Tyre? Sin. May have been a different sin, but it was sin. Why did God drive out all the nations of, of Canaan? Because of their sin. And so those are some things that I learned. Now, uh, if you didn't get all of that in your handout and you need that, wise, I can email that to you uh, because we're going to have to move on. All right, let's talk about uh, the prophecies here. I should have put up the third section. There's a third section. There's prophecies against the neighboring nations. And we'll talk about those neighboring nations in a moment. The second section of this is the prophecies against the cities of Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicians. 
Uh, the next section that's not on the screen that we'll get to next time is the section concerning Egypt is dealt with. And so these are the nations that are dealt with. So here's Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre and Sidon, and uh, Egypt is dealt with. All right, let's talk about his prophecy against Ammon in chapter 25. Now, we're not going to spend a great deal of time on each one of these because we want to get to the nation of Tyre or the city of Tyre and the nation of the, the, the uh, Phoenicians that we'll talk about here in a moment. So let's talk about Ammon. Here is the nation of Ammon for, for your uh, reference. Uh, this is the Dead Sea, the Jordan River, and this is where um, the nation of Ammon is, the Ammonites. Um, these were descendants of Lot. Now, let's talk about what the text says about them and what's going to happen to them. We won't spend a great deal of time. Verse 1 says he's going to prophesy um, to the Ammonites. And he basically in all of these mentions two things. Here's what you did. Here's what's going to happen. All right, here's what they did. Look at verse 3. Say to Ammon, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, aha, against my sanctuary when it was profane and against the hand of Israel when it was desolate and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. In other words, they rejoiced and clapped their hands and, and thought it was great when he, they saw the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah fall. At the first invasion, Ammon joined in uh, in fighting against God's people, uh, against Judah. 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 2. Uh, their first uh, was it Jehoiakim, I believe, who was uh, rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And as he rebelled, there were other nations joined in with, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar to fight against Judah, and Ammon was involved in that. Now, what's going to happen to them? Well, he said, uh, I will deliver you into the men of the east. In other words, that's to, to Babylon. I'm going to deliver you into the hand of Babylon, and uh, I'm going to punish you. And I will make Rabah a stable for camels, and a resting place for flocks. Here's your third time. Then shall they know, verse 5, that I am the Lord. Well, Nebuchadnezzar did exactly that in 581 B.C. That's when he, he brought this about. By the way, Jeremiah 49 is a parallel account to this, if you want to take a, take a note of that. In verse 7, I'm going to stretch out my hands. Well, let's go back to verse 6. Because you clapped your hands and stamped your feet, and rejoiced in your heart at the disdain of the land of Israel. So it's like they're standing up on the hill clapping their hands. I'm glad that happened to Israel. And they fell. I'm learning a lesson here about rejoicing in someone else's downfall because you may be next. You may be next. Now here's our fourth time at the end of verse 7. When this all comes to pass, when I destroy you, then shall you know that I am the Lord. God wants these nations to know that as well as everyone else. All right, that's, the nation, that's a prophecy against Ammon. God is not partial. In other words, he saw sin in Judah, he's going to deal with that. But he also saw problems over here in Ammon. I'm going to deal with them too. They're accountable to me. The Gentiles are accountable to me as well. All right, let's go next to the nation of Moab, verses 8 through 11. Where is Moab? This again is the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea. And you can see then the relationship or the close association uh, with Moab to the Dead Sea. Now, um, these also are descendants of Lot. Um, what did they do? Well, because Moab said, look, the house of Judah is like the nations. In other words, God's people are no different than anybody else. They're falling and they're being punished. In other words, for the same reason that uh, the Ammonites had fallen. Therefore, he said, I will clear the territory of Moab of the cities. In other words, I'm going to wipe you clean. And the men of east, that's Babylon, is going, are going to come, verse 10. And I will execute judgment upon Moab. Here's your fifth time. Then shall you know that I am the Lord. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar did that in 581 B.C., if you're keeping up with dates. All right? Not a long prophecy there against Moab. Let's talk about the next one, and that is Edom. Verses 12 to 14, uh, the Edomites. What about the Edomites? Where is Edom? Uh, now, at the top of your map up here is the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea of the Dead Sea. We had Moab right here, and now we're just coming south to Edom. Uh, the prophet is working in, in uh, clockwise fashion. 
starting with the Ammonites coming to Moab, then to Edom, and then he's going to go on to Philistia, and then go on up to Tyre and Sidon. Uh, so he's working in that fashion around uh, the nation of Judah. And so these are surrounding nations. They're going to fall, and they face uh, the problem as well. Now let's talk about verses 12 to 14, Edom. These are descendants of Esau, and uh, what's their problem? What did they do? Well, he said, uh, for I'm, I'm, I'm against them, verse, verse 12, because of what they did, taking uh, to the house of Judah by taking vengeance and greatly offending by avenging itself on them. Case in point. Verse 13, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut them off from beast and make them desolate from Teman, Dedan, and they shall fall by the sword. Now I'll come back to verse 12. But those two cities cannot be identified specifically. Some think they have, uh, can identify it, and others say we well, can't. Don't seem like we know exactly where those two cities are, um, but be that as it may, these were major cities, and they're going to be taken, they're going to fall. What was their problem? Well, they denied Israel passage as they were making their way toward the Canaan land. You remember in Numbers chapter 20, they wanted to cross through the land of Edom, and they would not allow the passage. They had to go around. And so because of that, God never forgot that. We see similar statements in Isaiah 63, Malachi 1, and uh, later in Ezekiel 35. So I'm going to lay my vengeance against them, and my anger and my fury is going to come upon them, and uh, they shall know my vengeance. That's not one of the seven, but it's, they'll, they'll know my vengeance when that time comes. Let's move on to Philistia, verses 15 to 17, to finish those four nations that are the neighboring nations. Philistia is along the Mediterranean coastline. Uh, they were perpetual enemies of the people of God, as you recall, from the time of the judges and the time of David to the time of uh, Saul and David. They were a perpetual enemy. Uh, in fact, he, he, uh, he calls them that. Um, notice it in verse 15. Because the Philistines dealt venge uh, vengefully and took vengeance with a spiteful heart to destroy because of the old hatred. Your translation may say instead of old hatred, the perpetual hatred. In other words, this wasn't a sudden thing that just rose up or it was a hatred of the past that's died down. This has gone on for years. In the days of the judges, they hated and they fought and they, they invaded uh, Judah and Israel. Uh, then later they invaded again and then they invaded again. And David had constant battles with, uh, with the Philistines. So on and on, this, this battle has gone for a long, long time. So because of that, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Cherethites. That's the people of Crete. You might check Amos 9 and 7 and 1 Chronicles 1, 12 for references on that. Meaning that the... The Philistines seem to have come from the island of Crete and made their way to the coastland. Why? Exactly, we don't know. But that seems to be the origin and where they came from. And I will execute great vengeance. And then, here's our sixth time, verse 17, they shall know that I am the Lord. They're going to know. These nations are going to come to a knowledge, and my own people are going to come to a knowledge that indeed um, I am the Lord God. All right, let's move on now to... Uh, the next, and that is the destruction of Tyre. Uh, this is in chapter 26. So we've covered 24 and 25, and we've covered these four nations, Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. But now there's the destruction of Tyre. Now that's going to carry us through uh, chapters 26, 27, and on up to chapter, what is it, 28, and in verse 19. Then there's a prophecy against Sidon. Uh, a sister city. Um, so one of your questions in your handout is why so much space and time and attention given to Tyre when only a few verses given to some of these other nations? And perhaps that's because and probably because of the political dominance and the commercial dominance which led to the political dominance of Tyre and, and the Phoenicians. So uh, let's talk about where they are. Uh, uh, this is Tyre um, in the region of Phoenicia, as you can see right up here circled. And it was the capital or the leading city of the, uh, the Phoenicians. But it was so prominent that most of the time the reference was made not to the nation of, of the Phoenicians, but of the city of Tyre. It was almost a kingdom to itself. And so God deals with them. 
So let's work our way through this chapter in the time we have left, and uh, let's see what we've, uh, what we've got. Um, this is what's said about the city of Tyre in this chapter. Now, the first date that's given is in uh, 5, uh, would be 586 in the 11th year, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. That's 586. Uh, this is when the same year that uh, Jerusalem fell. That's the date that's, that's given here. Now he said, uh, let, let's work through this list right here. Uh, well, first of all, I want to focus at verse 2. Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, aha, she is broken, who was the gateway of the peoples, now she's turned over to me and I shall be filled as she is laid away. Same kind of concept we saw with the Ammonites, except with this difference. That Tyre was a, was a maritime city. It was a city that was... Uh, very much involved in commercial trade, heavily involved in commercial trade, and one of the competitors would be Jerusalem, or the nation of Judah, and if Jeru uh, Judah falls and Jerusalem collapses, then here's what Tyre is saying, the city of Tyre, as if it's personified, I mean, as if it were a person saying, great, they fell, that means more trade comes to us. We get more money, we get more wealth, we get more trade. That's great for us. We're glad they collapsed. Now, because you did that, here's what's going to happen. So we're going to work through this list. Many nations are going to come against her. Look at verse 3. That I am against you, and I will cause many nations to come up against you, as the sea causes its waves to come. Well, how does the, sea, the waves of the sea come? Well, not just with one wave coming in, but there's a wave, and then there's another wave, and then there's another wave, and that's exactly what happened with nations. We'll see more about that about verse 12 here in a moment. Uh, there was one nation after another, and then it finally was utterly destroyed a little bit later after the time of Nebuchadnezzar. But be that as it may, verse 5, let's get ahead of ourselves, that, uh, and it shall be a place for spreading the nets of the sea as I have spoken, and it shall be plunder for the nation. So, uh, it's not just one nation is going to attack you. There's going to be many nations that are out for you. And they're going to invade you. And you're going to fall. Well, look at verse 4. We skipped verse 4. We came through verse 3. Uh, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break her down, down her towers. And I will scrape her, uh, scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. Well, Tyre was basically a rock. And by the time that the nations got through, that was scraped bare, and it was like the top of a rock. If you can imagine a mountain, and there's just nothing but rock, and you scrape it bare, and there's just a bare rock on the top. And he said, that's what I'm going to do to the city of Tyre. All right, let's go further. It's not going to be the commercial city that it was. It's going to be a place for spreading nets. And they'll, they'll come for, they're not coming to buy from you or to sell to you. This is going to be a place, because of all the rock, after you're laid bare, this is where they're going to lay their nets out to dry. That's going to happen. The suburb, suburbs are going to be destroyed. Look at verse 6. Also her daughter, villages, which are the fields, are slain by the sword. Then shall they know, here's number 7, then shall they know that I'm the Lord. There's your 7 that you've got. You should have 7. If you've been looking for those, that's your last. So the, the suburbs... Uh, that are around, all these little bergs around you, they're going to know I'm the Lord because they're going to catch, uh, they're going to be destroyed as well. Now beginning at verse 7, um, Nebuchadnezzar is identified, the king of Babylon, uh, with his horses and his chariots and his horsemen, and they're going to slay with a uh, sword uh, your daughter villages, that's the surrounding villages, and they'll heap up a siege against you. And notice the wording of verse 9. This is important because we're going to shift gears. He, Babylon, will direct his battering rams against the wall and his axes will break through your towers because of an abundance of his horses and the dust that they'll, and I'm paraphrasing, kick up. The horses will kick up and the wagons and the chariots. Uh, the city, the men will enter the city that has been breached and with the hooves of the horses they will trample the streets and slay your people. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and invade the city and breach the city and they're going to be in there. That's the mainland city. Um, now, let me get ahead of myself uh, to talk about there was the, the mainland city. Let's ignore what's right here in the middle for the time being. But there was the old Tyre mainland city, and then there was the island city, part of the city, that was separated by the waters. Made it almost impossible for others to invade because they couldn't lay a siege against it. Uh, and have airplanes as we could invade us an, uh, an island quite easily now. 
or some other way. But uh, that's almost impossible to, to build a siege against it. And so uh, the mainland is what we're talking about. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and he destroys the mainland city. And he did. Uh, and practically laid that city uh, completely waste. Now, look at verse 12. I said we're going to shift gears. Here's the gear that shifted. Notice it shifted from he to they. They will plunder your riches. In other words, with one wave after another that we've already talked about, of one nation after another, after another, after another, after another, there's going to be an invasion upon the city and the nation of, the, uh, of Phoenicia and the, and the city of the Philistines. Now this is quite interesting at verse, verse 12. They'll destroy your pleasant houses and they'll lay, uh, lay your stones, your timber, and your soil in the midst of the water. They're going to take what the city was built of and it's been laid waste and throw that out into the water. What a prophecy. It'd be interesting to know what, what that was about, wouldn't it? Let's see. And I'll put an end to your song. And notice at verse 14 now, before we leave that, uh, I want to, well, I want to notice at, uh, yeah, verse, verse 13 I skipped. I'll put an end to your song. Verse 14 is what I'm looking for. I will make an end, I'll make you like the top of the rock, and it shall be a place for the spreading of net, and it'll never be rebuilt. That's what I wanted you to see. And it never was. I read today earlier that, uh, and I didn't go back to document that, that the city had been invaded many years before and had been rebuilt and came back to the status that it once was, but that ain't going to happen again. And it hasn't happened again. Tyre was never rebuilt um, in, the, in the city that it, that it once was. Now let's stop and, and footnote right here before we go any further uh, and talk about what happened. That Nebuchadnezzar invaded the mainland city. He, he invaded this mainland city over here. But he did not take the island part. And it wasn't until Alexander the Great, in th uh, let me back up though, that Nebuchadnezzar laid siege against the city for 13 years, I understand, from 585 to 573 uh, B.C. But it wasn't until 332 B.C. that Alexander the Great took the spoils from the mainland city and made this causeway. He built this causeway that was um, 200 feet wide and a half a mile long. And with that debris, he filled it, the waters and built a causeway so that he could make it all the way over to the island and captured the city and took the city and it collapsed. Well, that's what God said was going to happen. Didn't tell us it's Alexander the Great, but he said it's going to happen. They're going to take your goods and they're going to just throw them into the, into the waters. Well, that's exactly uh, what happened and how prophecy then was fulfilled. Now let's go further. In verses 15 to 18, it's going to cause others to tremble. When they see this great city of Tyre, if it falls, then that could happen to us too. It could happen to any city, is what the people are thinking. So, look at verse 15. Will the coastlands not shake at the sound of your fall when the wounded cry and the slaughter is made in the midst? He said, people are going to be get trembling and they're going to be crying and they're going to be, they're going to be wondering what on earth is going on. Now, the downfall of the mainland city took place about 574, I think it was, B.C., but 332 B.C. is when the city finally was taken on the, uh, uh, on the island. One last thing, and then we're going to be done. Let's go 19 to 21. Tyre will never be inhabited again. Uh, I will make you desolate like cities that are not inhabited, and I will bring the deep upon you, and the great waters will cover you. Uh, in other words, I will make you a terror. Finally, verse 21, and you shall be no more. You're not going to be again. You're not going to rebuild. You're not going to recover from this. God indeed deals with the nations. So what we've seen is the, the closing out of chapter 24 of that previous section, uh, the cooking pot and the wife's death symbolize the fall of the city of Jerusalem. The rest of this deals with the surrounding nations and there's value to be learned about the surrounding nations falling. And God is, in judge, God is a judge of those nations.